Welcome to the Fluby Dust series. This is a series of videos that will cover miscellaneous topics in electrical engineering. This video is about one of my pet peeves, numeric constants and formulas. We will look at a few examples and determine how they came about. Numeric constants are often found in formulas for engineering. Let me start with a clarification about the title of this video. Numeric constants are very useful and save time when doing calculations. There is nothing wrong with them at all. I just happen to be a very curious person when it comes to math and engineering. Often these numeric constants come from underlying physical constants or some other fundamental property. I believe numeric constants were more relevant back in the days of slide rules and hand calculators, whereas today the computer allows us to utilize the full precision of a physical constant or the log of a fraction. The ubiquitous NE555 timer integrated circuit, when it emerged onto the market in 1972, could be the point where I became curious about those numbers like 1.1. 0.693, and 1.44. Since the 555 timer works with the charging and discharging of a capacitor through resistors, they come from associated equations for capacitor charging, and we will get insight into that. We will look at a 555 timer's monostable and astable modes of operation. Another fundamental formula with a numeric constant is the relationship of the cutoff frequency of a low-pass system versus the rise time of an input square wave. Turns out, we can use the same method to detail this constant as with the 555 A-stable operation. We will also look at where the mysterious-looking number 60 comes from in the formula for the characteristic impedance of a coaxial structure. One basic example of the use of numeric constants is in the formulas for conversion of temperature between Fahrenheit and Celsius, which is simple and obvious. Here's the formula shown often with the 9 fifths fraction. It's pretty obvious that the number 32 relates to the freezing point of water in Fahrenheit, but there are other relevant numbers you don't see, like the freezing point of water for Celsius at zero the boiling point of water in Fahrenheit at 212, and the boiling point of water in Celsius at 100. This circled portion of the formula represents a scale factor in the range between the boiling and freezing point in Fahrenheit over the boiling and freezing point in Celsius. Since the freezing point in Fahrenheit starts at 32, the scale factor needs to be offset by 32. That leads to this formula with a scale factor of 1.8. It is often shown in its rational form of 9 fifths. Let's move on to electronics. Signetics marketed the 555 timer in 1972, and this is the data book for the 555 and 556 timers dated 1973. It became very popular and billions were sold. One book says it's probably the most popular integrated circuit ever made. This data book has the formulas for the monostable and astable timing shown here. These equations with numeric constants show up as exact copies in modern data sheets. Let's proceed with understanding these constants. Here is a block diagram of the 555 timer. It has three 5K resistors as a voltage divider, providing voltage references for the inputs of two comparators, being one-third VCC and two-thirds VCC. It's been said that the three 5K resistors is how the IC got its 555 name. In red are the external component connections, a resistor and capacitor, of which determines the time duration of the monostable mode. The timer is triggered when the trigger input is taken below one-third VCC. That causes the output of this comparator to go high, setting the set-reset flip-flop, and therefore the output goes high. 
Because the negative output of the flip-flop has gone low, it turns off the discharge transistor that had the timing capacitor shorted. The external capacitor begins to charge exponentially through RA. When it reaches the threshold voltage of two-thirds VCC, the output of this comparator goes high, which resets the flip-flop and causes the output to go back to low. Now let's go figure out what that 1.1 is all about. Let's first review the formula for a capacitor charging. Recall that the Greek letter tau is shorthand for RC, which is the time constant. The horizontal time axis is in number of time constants. Here's the equation and a simple schematic of the capacitor being charged through a resistor. When the switch is closed, the capacitor exponentially charges to the voltage of the DC source E. Note the capacitor charges to 63.2% at 1 tau and 98.2% at 5 tau. Let's leave the charging curve as a dotted line target for this example. One difference with the 555 timer is the capacitor is shorted with an internal transistor switch and is open to allow the capacitor to charge. When the capacitor reaches two-thirds VCC, the time is 1.1 tau. Well, that tells us where the 1.1 numeric constant came from. Let's mathematically derive it. Here's our capacitor charging circuit. The formula for the capacitor voltage is a function of time. Let's rearrange to solve it for T. The trigger point for the timing is two-thirds of the power supply E. So VC over E is two-thirds. Plugging in the two-thirds into the equation results in 1.098 tau, a more exact number than 1.1. To get a more meaningful number, we can apply the logarithm reciprocal rule. According to that rule, the logarithm of the reciprocal of any function is equal to its negative logarithm. Applying that rule to the negative natural log of one-third gives us the natural log of three. We can substitute that natural log of three for any instance of the 1.1 for the 555 monostable timing. Here's the diagram for an A-stable operation. The capacitor charges through the series combination of RA and RB. It discharges through RB. The capacitor voltage oscillates between one-third VCC and two-thirds VCC. To calculate the frequency of operation, we must know the time that it takes to charge and discharge the capacitor. The data book equation for the time the waveform is high is that mysterious 0.693 number. Same for the time the waveform is low. The time of the period, capital T, is the sum of those times. Here's our capacitor charging chart again, zoomed into a range from 0 to 1.3 tau. At 1 third VCC, the time is 0.4 tau. At 2 thirds VCC, the time is 1.1 tau. The difference between those times is 0.7 tau. Hey, that's remarkably close to the 0.693 number in the equation. Let's go figure out what it is exactly. The lower trigger point is where the capacitor voltage equals one-third of the supply E. We rearrange that in terms of VC over E. We can pop that into our formula for time here. Solving for time, we get 0 0.4055 time constants. This is the start time. The upper trigger point, as we said, is when the capacitor voltage is two-thirds of the supply E. This comes out to a time of 1.0986 time constants. Taking the difference between the two gives us that 0 0.693 number we are looking for. I only show it to four decimal places. Let's find a more meaningful representation for it. We are subtracting the log of two different numbers. We can use the logarithm quotient rule to change subtraction into division. The log of m minus the log of n equals the log of m over n, provided that all the log functions are the same base. Here's the subtracted form. 
And now the quotient form gives us the natural log of 2. So anytime we need to use the point 6 times 3 constant, we can use the natural log of 2. Let's review the formulas for the 555 timer in a stable mode. The time the output is high uses this formula since the charging happens with RA and RB in series. The time the output is low is just the discharge time through RB. By the way, the difference in time between discharging between any two voltages is the same as the charge time between the same two voltages. Therefore, we don't need to involve the discharge formulas. The period time, capital T, is the sum of the high time and the low time, resulting in that formula we have seen in the data books. Of course, the frequency is the reciprocal of time. The data books save you time by taking the reciprocal of 0.693 as the numerator 1.44. It's satisfying to me to use the natural log of 2. The duty factor, for some reason in the data book, represents the time the output is low. The 0.693s and the Cs cancel, and we are left with this. Now that we took the mystery out of the 555 timer numeric constants, let's move on to another topic. A mathematical relationship exists between the rise time and bandwidth of a system. In electronics, when describing a voltage or current step function, rise time is the time taken by a signal to change from a specified low percent value to a specified high percent value. It's most always defined between 10% and 90%, although 20 to 80% is sometimes used. This applies to a single or dominant pole low pass system, where the bandwidth is the cutoff frequency or the minus 3 dB point. The formula for the bandwidth is 0.35 over the rise time. Here's the RC time constant page in Wikipedia. If you scroll down, you'll see that 0.35 number is for the rise time between 10 and 90 percent. Let's go figure out where the 0.35 numeric constant comes from. We get lucky here because we can use the same method we used in the 555A stable mode. Instead of going from one-third to two-thirds, we calculate the time constants from one-tenth, which gives us 0.1054 tau, to nine-tenths, which gives us 2.3026 tau. Then taking the difference, we get 2.1972 tau. Using the logarithm quotient rule again, we find that 2.1972 time constants is equal to the natural log of 9. This is the rise time. For the bandwidth, we first arrange the equation to solve for tau. The cutoff frequency of a low-pass system is when the resistance equals the capacitive reactance, then rearranging to solve for a cutoff frequency, which is the same as bandwidth, then substituting our expression for tau into the formula, multiplying the numerator and denominator by the natural log of 9 gives us the natural log of 9 over 2 pi times the rise time. But we can simplify that even further. The 2 in the denominator is the same as 1 half in the numerator. Recall the logarithm power rule. If there is a value multiplied in front of a logarithm, the value can be taken as an exponent to the argument. We can cast that 1 half inside the log function as an exponent to have 9 raised to the half power, which is the square root of 9, and therefore the natural log of 3. The mysterious 0.35 number we saw is precisely the natural log of 3 divided by pi. The last topic for the video is regarding the characteristic impedance of a coaxial structure. It's a function of the outer diameter to the inner diameter. To say it more accurately, the inside diameter of the shield to the diameter of the center conductor since high frequencies travel on surfaces. The equation for the characteristic impedance, as commonly seen in textbooks, is 60 over the square root of the dielectric constant ER 
times the natural log of the ratio of the diameters. So where did the number 60 come from? It must be something Babylon. It's just a perfect non-prime number. Is it exactly 60 or rounded? Well, the real expanded formula for the characteristic impedance contains the square root of the permeability over the permittivity. It turns out that the square root of mu over epsilon is the impedance of free space, 377 ohms. Let's plug in those constants and see what we get. Mu naught is the permeability constant, 4 pi times 10 to the minus 7 henrys per meter. Since there are generally no magnetic forces involved in a coaxial structure, the relative permeability is 1. The permittivity constant, epsilon naught, is 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12. But it's a coax, so you have some sort of dielectric to keep the center conductor in place, and it will have a value of relative permittivity, also called the dielectric constant, and is intended to be an input variable to this impedance formula. Having that said, let's just work with the front of the formula. We will need to pull epsilon r out of the radical. Plugging in the physical constants, we get 59.9585 ohms. Rounded to 60 is only a 0.07% error. By the way, if you are curious about this being in ohms, just know that one set of SI units for a Henry is volt second per ampere, and farad is ampere second per volt, which comes out to ohms. Sometimes you will see the characteristic impedance formulas with the log base 10 of the ratio of diameters. That can be resolved using the logarithm base change rule. You basically divide the log base C of X divided by the log base C of the desired base number. In this case, the log base 10 of E, which is 0.434. This gives us 138.155. In summary, we determined that the rounded numerical constants we analyzed came from fundamental numbers like the natural log of an integer or a collection of physical constants. If used in their prime form, like the natural log of the integer, you can have very good precision. Is the improved precision important? Well, no, not so much. For instance, the tolerance of selected components will result in a greater error than the given precision of the rounded constant. And dielectric constants vary more than the rounded 60 number. If precision is not important, then why did we do all this? Well, I don't know about you, but it gave me a much better understanding of the circuits and the math. It removed the mystery of the numbers. So I don't really hate numeric constants and formulas. They are very practical for use and most I have seen provide sufficient precision. What I really hate is not knowing where they come from. However, I think the usage of these exact numbers, like the natural log of an integer, would be a great application in a spreadsheet calculator. You have all that precision of a computer. You might as well use it. Thanks for watching. Please click the like, subscribe, and notification bell so you don't miss any upcoming content.